Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you all for joining us. My name is Caitlin, and I um, work at Square Books. Uh, we're here tonight for um, a discussion of The Night Always Comes by Willie Broughton. He's joined in, in conversation by uh, Bill Boyle, hometown hero. But before I uh, pass it on to them, I wanted to do a little bit of um, Square Books housekeeping and talk about some upcoming events. There's a lot of them. We're really busy. I'm not gonna talk about all of them, but I'd encourage you to check them out. Um, most of them are free to attend. Um, so here we go. Monday, April 26th at noon. This is an exclusive pre-publication virtual event for um, John Grisham and his new novel, Suli, which is um, not a legal thriller, but um, a basketball novel. And he will be joining conversation with, uh, by Wright Thompson. Um, so this is an exclusive event. So you do have to pre-order a signed first edition of Suli from Square Books to um, be invited. Uh, signed first editions don't cost any more than an unsigned first edition. And to kind of sweeten the deal, uh, John sent us a signed basketball. Uh, this is my uh, assistant, Carla. <laughs> um, so uh, you'll have a chance to win a basketball autograph by John um, if you uh, purchase a signed first edition. Again, that's Monday, April 26th at noon on Zoom. Uh, then on uh, next Wednesday at 5.30, we have um, kind of a literary salon night uh, with three authors from uh, the publisher Sourcebooks. Um, so it'll be an evening of conversation between these three writers and they discuss their three recent novels, um, all set in the South, past and present. So um, that should be nice. Uh, one of the authors, Kelly Mustian, is from um, Natchez. So we are especially excited to host her. All right, almost done. Uh, Tuesday, May the 4th, we have three virtual events. So you're bound to be interested in at least one of them. At two o'clock, we're partnering with Tattered Cover in Denver, Colorado for W. Bruce Cameron's um, A Dog's Courage. Um, and I'm pretty sure there's going to be a puppy show and tell. So if you are a dog person, um, I think that's gonna be really sweet. Um, we love W. Bruce Cameron and we are excited for his new book, A Dog's Courage. At five o'clock, we are partnering with a um, bevy of wonderful independent bookstores and for our Strauss and Giroux to um, celebrate River Solomon's newest book, uh, Sorrowland. Now this is also an exclusive event. Um, you do have to purchase the book to attend and um, but you'll get a signed book plate edition. We are just like nuts for rivers. This book is amazing. If you're interested in kind of speculative literary fiction, you're really going to love Sorrowland. Hope you can join us. Almost finished, six o'clock, Tuesday, May 4th. Um, it's an evening in Elizabeth High School's kitchen for Come On Over. This is a ticketed event um, and part of the ticket proceeds go to uh, a fundraiser for St. Jude's Children's Hospital. Uh, this would make a really great Mother's Day gift because you both get a signed first edition of Come On Over and she gets to participate in this you know, uh, exclusive virtual event or whoever, it doesn't have to be your mom, you could come too. Okay, phew, done. On to the main event. Uh, I wanna tell you a little more about uh, Willie and Bill. Uh, Willie is the author of the novels, The Motel Life, Northline, Lean on Pete, The Free, and Don't Skip Out on Me. He is the founding member of the bands, Richmond Fontaine and The Delines. He lives outside of Portland, Oregon. Bill Boyle is from New Brooklyn, New York, and his novels include Gravesend, which was nominated for the Grand Prix de Literature Policière in France, The Lonely Witness, which was nominated for the Hammett Prize in the Grand Prix de, Lit de Literature Policière, and A Friend is a Gift You Give Yourself, and most recently, City of Margins, a Washington Post best thriller and mystery book of 2020. He also has a new book out in November called Shoot the Moonlight Out. He lives in Oxford, Mississippi, and we are so glad that he does. Um, we have, um, so make sure you pre-order his new book too. Okay, so I know everyone is tired of hearing from me, so I'm going to uh, pass it off to uh, Willie and Bill. You guys, thanks so much for joining us. Um, also, if uh, any of y'all out there have any questions for Willie or Bill, please submit them in the Q&A and I'll come back and moderate this. Um, all right. I'll, Kick it off to y'all. Thanks. Thanks, Caitlin. Hey, Bill, how you doing? Good. How's it going, Willie? 
Good to see you, man. Yeah, by the flag, square book flag. Nice. Nice. Well, I got I got my fat possum record shirt on. I should have worn my square book shirt too. Thanks oh, for man. doing this, man. Fat possum is a, is a great <laughs> Thanks for doing this. I hope everybody, uh, thanks thanks to everybody who's here. I hope the sound is okay. I'm getting a little tiny bit of echo, so I don't know if that's just me or what, but um, if anybody's having trouble uh, with the sound at all, just let us know or let Caitlin know because I'm on the phone and I don't see the chat, so I apologize. I'm not ignoring uh, that stuff. Um, we're really excited to, to have Willie. Um, Thanks, Caitlin, for introducing uh, us, and for uh, and thanks to Square Books for doing this. Um, I, I started reading Willie about, uh, geez, probably about thirteen years ago now. Um, Northline had just come out, and I was in a bookstore in the Bronx. I was living in the Bronx. Um, Bronx doesn't have a lot of bookstores. I think they have one now, but this was like just a Barnes and Noble or something in the Bronx. And I picked up Northline because it had uh, blurbs by um, George Pelicanos and Tom Franklin on it. And I didn't know the book. I hadn't heard anything about it at that point. Picked that up and I just, I liked the look of it. And I saw the other book there too, The Motel Life. So I got both of them. I read them both in about, you know, a few days. Um, and since then, I've been calling Willie my favorite writer, I think. So it's been, and, you know, I, then I found the music. I went back and, and heard the Richmond Fontaine stuff, um, which I love. Um, I make a killer Richmond Fontaine mix if anybody needs one. Um, and then I, uh, you know, I kept with each novel and uh, each record um, as it came out. And then the last Richmond Fontaine record was 2016 and then the Deline started and um, there's been a handful of novels since then and some stories here and there and and Willie's continued to be this uh, just just a, a just my favorite writer just a great inspiration to me as a as a writer and as a, as a person so I'm really honored to, to get to do this and uh, get to talk to him about this book which is I say this every time I feel like but maybe my favorite of his um, you know, and I, and I mean it every time too. Um, but uh, there, something about this one just has, has hit me in a way that um, has been more immediate somehow. I don't know. I don't know what it is exactly. It's one of the only books I've ever read three times in such a short period of time too. And, and it's been an interesting way to kind of live with this book and really be, I feel like almost as wrapped up in it as I do in my own stuff you know it's the only other stuff I read as much you know as my own uh, my own writing because I have to read multiple drafts of stuff um but this is this is different but I'm really um kind of still you know six months after reading it the first time still totally lost in the world of this book so um thanks Willie thanks for being here and um, thanks to everybody who's listening thanks for uh, being so nice with that hey we First time we met was in Oxford, right? Yeah, I think I think the first time we met in person was when you were here for the free. And uh, you and Tom Franklin and a couple other guys, we went. Yeah. And that was one, you know, because I always wanted to hang out with guys that liked books. <laughs> I never, before I published a book, I never, I, you know, I had one buddy that liked books, but he, yeah, yeah. he was just, he just liked books. But it, I, it was so fun. Uh, hanging out with you guys because it was like the first time I've been with with other guys around my age, you know, that yeah. like they were like really into books, and it was so fun. And I was just kind of like on a because you guys were all old friends, and uh, and it was kind of remarkable for me to just kind of be a fly on the wall and hear you guys talk about books and 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 I've told you this before, but you know I never read Stephen King or knew much about Stephen King. Uh, and I always had it, you know, I just didn't, I don't know why I didn't go there. And then hearing you guys after a few drinks, all you guys talked about was Stephen King. And I went back and I read, I wrote down at the end of the night, I wrote down all the ones you guys talked about, like Del Dolores Claiborne, born in uh, misery. And, uh, and man, I read those and I, they just blew me away. Uh, you know, I, I was missing. So is this, I, I'll never forget that night. I have a, a, a really fucking horrible memory. But I'll always remember that night because it was like, God, if life could have been like this. <laughs> Oxford, Mississippi, I can hang out with guys that like books. It was, it was unreal. 
Was- yeah, man, that was a great night. And I felt, you know, and I moved to Oxford from New York, I felt the same way. I hadn't had that really ever in New York. And then moving here, it was like that, you know, every time I went to City Grocery, you know, it was like Larry Brown had had that had been his place. And then, you know, you're hanging out with all these writers and people and booksellers and readers and people who love books. And it's just, you know, get a night like that in Oxford. And it's really like, you know, really uh, you, you see what what makes it hard to leave this place. Um, and that was one of the best. Yeah, that was a great night, man um yeah and then i think you came one you, then you came one other time after that for the conference for the book um i guess when i mean i was after don't skip out on me came out but it was not long after um so yeah man thanks 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 for coming here uh you know in my early 20s a, a friend of mine told me to read this guy named larry brown who had a book just out it was a i was taking a night class in creative writing at, at the university in reno and the teacher she she's she said man there's this guy larry brown who has a book called facing the music that you should check out and ever since then i was you know he really changed my life and and made me feel less alone uh, about writing but after that, I'd always wanted to go to Oxford, and 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 it's as cool as you would. Is I dreamed about it, and and uh, and the bookstore is amazing too. So yeah. Anyway. Yeah, Thank man. You. Yeah, and then that's you know that's same same thing for me. That's how I wound up down here is because I loved loved Larry Brown, and uh, that's what kind of made me want to come here. It wasn't I like Faulkner, okay, and you know, and there was there was the music too. You know, I was listening to a lot of that R L Burnside. And, Junior Kimbrough and that stuff, but Larry Brown was, will put it on the map really for me. Uh, and yeah. I think probably when we first started talking, I, I emailed you at some point, I got your email from Tom Franklin, like maybe 2010 or so. And I think that was when we first started talking, maybe 2011. And one of the first things we talked about was was Larry Brown, how much we loved Larry Brown, how much he meant to you and, and uh, I meant to me too. So that's cool, man. Yeah, 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 man. Um, so let's talk about Willie's new book is called The Night Always Comes um, and it's out came out a couple of weeks ago um, and it's a book you should go go get right now um, uh, Square Books has I think signed book plate first editions um, so get it if you haven't gotten it already like I said it's it's maybe my favorite of his um, you know and there's a there's a a lot of competition there. I love them all. Um, like, like with all of his books, there's, uh, you know, there's, there's usually either one character or two or three characters that you really follow. Um, I think I was trying to think about this. I didn't really do a comprehensive, uh, list. I should have, but is this, is this the only book other than Northline where you're just with one person or Lean on Pete too? Is Lean on Pete also just Charlie? I can't remember. Yeah, yeah, you're right. But I feel, unlike you, man, I, it, it might be because I'm not, uh, I don't have the intelligence for it. Uh, of the interest, like you, can, you have the ability to juggle six or 12 people in the air at the same time. And, and, I, and I don't think I've ever had that ability I, I think what I've always wanted to do is have you just full heartedly disappear into one person so, yeah. you, forget, so you forget your reading. I, I, I think maybe that's that's why. But you but you're right. This book is 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 pretty heavy just on one person uh, more so than even my other ones. And and that's kind of the way I run anyway, I guess. Yeah. And so this is yeah, this is uh, Lynette is the main character of this book. You don't ever learn her last name. Uh, she's 30. She lives in Portland, and the setup of the book—I won't—I won't go too much into um, plot stuff, but uh, I will talk a little bit about the setup. The setup of the book is she's basically working three jobs: a bakery, bartender. Uh, she has a, a kind of side illegal job that you know I won't get into right now. You know, um, and then she's also taken classes at a community college. Um, her plan is to buy this shitty house that her her mother and her developmentally disabled brother kenny have lived in for forever um and when she comes home from work um her mom has a new car in the driveway and is basically like forget it 
we're not buying, I bought this car. I don't want the house. She can't get a loan on her own because she's got bad credit. So she's relying on her mom for the loan. And so her mom, her mom's impulsive decision not to, um, not to stick with the house or stick with their plan um, really throws her into this kind of spiral, this kind of desperate spiral of like, she's, she's trying to figure things out. She's trying to figure out, can she still get the house? How can she get the money? So it's this great, it, it's a, you know, it's character driven and place driven novel, but it's also got a kind of great um, crime novel set up in that you have this damaged, desperate character thrown into this desperate situation. And this odyssey plays out over a couple of days and a couple of nights in Portland where she's kind of digging up old ghosts and looking for a way out of this or looking to make sense of all this. So, uh, and she's just a just an amazing um, character, just this troubled, but good and good hearted um, woman who's just you know, scraping by, trying to trying to find some compassion and some empathy in a in a Portland that has changed drastically. Um, so let's start there. And and I did a I did an interview with Willie uh, about a month ago that just went live today on the Southwest Review. So I'm not going to try not to just say the same things that we said in that interview, but I do want to talk about because this is so much a novel about Portland. Can you can you talk a little bit about you know, what about Portland um, and what about the situation there in the last 10 or 15 years kind of planted the seed to write this book? I think, uh, I mean, it's, it's happening all over the West, you know, Seattle, Portland, even my hometown of Reno, where uh, just rapid gentrification and, and just rapid uh, housing prices, housing prices going up. I mean, I think in the last 20 years, uh, housing prices have quadrupled here and, and minimum wage is only doubled. So that's a scary statistic right there. I think, I think what started for me was I would drive past downtown Portland and I'd see the cranes and the cranes just meaning the, the buildings, the new buildings going up and there'd be like 10 or 15 of them going and, and, and you're like, there's 10 or 15 buildings going up downtown. And I've, I live outside of Portland, but I, I ran an office in, in St. John's, kind of like the one of the last like kind of working class areas. And in the last five years, I've seen four apartment complexes go up and, and four of the mom and pop stores have been closed down and sold off and are going to be torn down and, and some kind of apartment building is going to go up. And then these kind of like cool little craftsman houses that you see all over Portland. Um, suddenly, like houses that were built for working class people in the 20s, 30s, 40s um, are, are suddenly going for like $400,000, even beat up ones. And, and in, the, in the book, I have the, the landlord was going to list the house for 300000 And that same sort of house would now, in just four years, it'd be almost $400,000 now. So um, I think it was just fear and, and not really understanding what's going on. And then at the same time, there's tent cities appearing in Portland. Like outside my window, they, they, there was a tent city of five tents, um, and that just got moved because the, this new apartment building's being put up, and they, they were getting in the way of the construction workers. But there's just this really dramatic shift in the city that was so dramatic, it, it felt desperate. And I, and I say the same sort of thing, but, but it, it, feel, it felt like that to me where everybody's suddenly driving past you in, in nice cars and you're still walking and you're like, well, what, what the hell is going on? Did all these people seem to have money and you don't know where the money's coming from and they know something you don't know. And, and the way I kind of always thought of things is you just work harder. But like Lynette, like she works harder, but she works harder from within the framework she knows of, which is work harder, sleep less. Uh, you know, if you don't make enough money with one job, you just get another job. And so she's kind of on that that treadmill uh, when you meet her. And and I guess I guess all those the combination of everything I just said is kind of what that made me sit down and 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 write the book and and, and kind of gear it in a more noir feel because it feels desperate. She's kind of a broken 
desperate person kind of pushed into having to make a drastic decision to try to, in her own way, save her family. Yeah, and how'd you settle on, so, you know, Lynette, like I said, is is 30, so she's kind of, she's, she's old enough to have, you know, seen the change, kind of witnessed the change firsthand, the place is totally different, or is becoming totally different than the place she's known, but she also has this really important sense of community and, and of, you know, knowing that, you know, in the neighborhood, if they keep the house, there are people who watch out for her brother. And, and part, of the, part of the routine of her day is that people watch out for her brother. They, they know each other. They take care of each other. Um, how'd you settle on, on this, this 30-year-old woman um, as, the, as the vehicle to tell this, this story? I guess, to, in a way, it started with the brother. Um, I wanted, I always think every family carries weight on them. Every, like, they're, you know, I always think about it and it's true, which is that, that old saying, which is that be kind to everybody you meet because everybody's in a great battle. And I think that's true with families. Uh, you see everybody's carrying weight or they have problems. Uh, and so I, I, I was thinking, how does a, a family that's really just barely scraping by to start out with, and they're not making the best decisions um, and they don't really get along. How, how do they handle such a change, like rapid rent increases and uh, the housing prices increases while like their jobs are still making the same dough. So I, I said, if, if with, because of their brother, the brother opens up a bunch of different ideas, which is they stick together or they, they disband because of it. I think if, if Lynette was a man, he would have left. He would have just abandoned the brother and the mother, most likely. And I think Lynette was kind of geared to be and brought up to be a servant, um, a caretaker to her brother. And I think a lot of the problems of Lynette uh, mentally uh, are because she spent her whole life in kind of a care situation instead of getting to be a kid, getting to be loved like a kid and nurtured. She was put more in like a job of a caretaker. Um, so I thought if, if, I made, if I made Lynette a guy, he would have bailed a long time ago. Uh, uh, I am rough, rough on, on men, you know, in, my, in this book. <laughs> But I was raised by a woman, you know, uh, who got pushed around by men her whole life. And so uh, uh, I, I would guess that's probably where that comes from. Um, and I wanted a reason for the for the mother and Lynette to be still together at an age when they shouldn't be together. Um, and, and really, I think it's it's a breakup novel in a way. It's the mom, the mom's breaking up with Lynette and, and Lynette's trying to say to the mom, look, if we stick it out, even though you don't like me and we don't like each other, and I know I've done you some damage, but if we stick it out, we have a place here. And, and that old school American dream of home ownership could be ours and we can break ourselves out of the, this chain of poverty that we're, gonna, we're really gonna be in if we don't take this last shot. And the mom's more like, what's the point? Is, you know, that somebody's figured it out, but it's not us. There's somebody that's going to be able to buy a four hundred thousand dollar tear down house and then put something else in its place, but it's not us. So just give up. Uh, and and so the novel kind of has that that feel of a, of a long breakup as well. That I yeah. Was interested in. Yeah, and and yeah, you know, the the first time I read it, I, obviously I was you know I was totally swept up in Lynette, and then the second time I read it. I think I was, you know, I still swept up in Lynette, but I did think a lot more about this kind of catalog of, of bad men she encounters throughout the book. And I was also, I was raised by a single mom and, and I'm also rough on men in my novels. Um, so I appreciate that. But this, I gotta say the third time I read it, I was more fascinated than ever by, by the mom, Doreen. Um, and I also, I also noticed this time, I guess it took me three times to realize that the dad has left Doreen for his new wife, Noreen, um, or his new girlfriend, Noreen. <laughs> but uh, so, Dor so Doreen, Lynette's mom. Um, I was, I was wondering about her. You know, what just kind of what you think about her, her as a character is the difference between her and Lynette. That, and this is maybe a, a naive comment, but it's just something that kind of occurred to me today, and I hadn't 
thought about it previously, I guess, is the fundamental difference between them that Lynette believes people can change and her mother's given up on that idea. Her mother thinks people don't change any, you know? Yeah, I mean, I think, I, I think first the, the mom married a bad guy and, and, and had a severely disabled son. And the severely disabled, like so many families, break apart uh, with that, and 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 hers did, and then her husband doesn't um, pay child support, and and she works at Fred Meyer, like a grocery store, and so she's really struggling, and she she's a woman that just kind of grinds it out, and and she's just get she just got tired, and she was doing the best she could, I think the mom, and she but she put too much pressure on Lynette. And Lynette started cracking, and and I think when Lynette starts cracking, like when she's in high school and, yeah. and she mentally goes down, I think it just takes it out uh, out of the mom. So the mom's working; she's got a severely disabled son, and then her daughter either rages or is suicidal. Um, and I think I think it's just worn the mom out, and the mom's just too tired. You know, so people get broken; they give yeah. up, and I think one of the ideas in the book was to give up or not to give up. And, and Lynette's mother is saying like, it's, there's no point, just give up and, you know, and whatever happens, happens. And we'll try to, we'll try to squeak out whatever we can and whatever we can grab for ourselves, let's grab it. And Lynette, I think is, is ruled by guilt a little bit and, and, and is ashamed of how beat up she's kind of been to her mother uh, and, and how she's raged against her mother. Um, that, that I think she still believes in community and she, and she still sees that there is hope. The only answer is to, 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 to make the wave of gentrification and, 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 and to lift themselves above it. And, and she hasn't, you know, I think the next damage is to herself. Uh, and if she hasn't been that beat up by her situation, like she doesn't have a son with severe disabilities. Uh, she didn't have a husband that left her and she, you know, she sees ways out. Uh, uh, and I think she's young enough to still believe that she can help and save her family. Um, and her mother's, you know, trying to sink a, an already sinking ship. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And she's, I mean, it's a, it's a fascinating character and a fascinating dynamic between those two. And, and I think when we talked last time, you referred to it as a breakup novel too, or referred to that scene in the beginning between them as a long kind of breakup scene. And it, I mean, it is, I guess, you know, it's we're not, not something you typically think about breaking up with your parents, but it is, I mean, it is that, you know, and it can be as, as hard as a breakup in a marriage or a, a, you know, a relationship like that. I mean, so that, that really sets the stage for, for everything that comes. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the book. Let's switch gears just a second, talk a little bit about uh, Noir and the influence of Noir on this book. I think all of your books to me, you know, you know I'm somebody who likes um, generally, I think Noir that is kind of character and place driven anyway. Um, and same goes for crime fiction. So I'm not always interested in, actually pretty rarely interested in crime itself, um, more, more just kind of, you know, what it does to people, how things spiral out of control. And I think there's always some element of that in your books, um, even, even if it's relatively small or just a scene or just an incident. Um, this one kind of leans into it a little bit more heavily because there is, there is at least one part of the plot that that is kind of a kind of kind of a crime plot or a little bit of a crime plot anyway with the I won't say too much about it but there's a safe and there's some sketchy some sketchy guys involved um so can you talk about the influence of that just kind of noir writers noir um fiction or film noir um how that influences you or how you think about it um when you're writing it's interesting because I know we've talked about Barry Gifford before and you've, you've interviewed Barry Gifford, but I, I was just going to a library uh, in Reno and, and Wild at Heart was on the new release shelf and it had a cool title and it had a cool cover. And so I just picked it up and I didn't know, I didn't know anything about noir at all, man. And, um, and I read it and I just, it blew me away and I just loved it. And, and I wouldn't really call him a noir writer, but 
but uh, he yeah. but I started reading all his books and then I then at the same time I, I went to a bookstore and there in in Reno and there was a, a, a cardboard cutout of uh, like a crazed looking cowboy with a gun and in in, in little shelves on his chest were uh, black lizard books and 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 they just had cool covers and they had great names like Jim Thompson uh, a swell looking babe or Charles Williford's pickup or uh, David Goodis's Cassidy's girl and and I just and they were thin and they had that uh, they had the just that uh, black and white really interesting covers and so I just grabbed them not knowing anything about them and I bought three of them and and I and I, I loved them little did I know that Barry Gifford and you have the Black Lizard books uh poster behind you yeah. little did I know that Barry Gifford uh you know helped start Black Lizard Press and he got Jim Thompson and Charles Williford and David Goodis back in print um I mean so it was a really interesting time and I remember talking to Barry about it later on and he said to him, those books were psychologically damaged people writing about psychologically damaged people. And that made sense to me. And then maybe that's what always led me to those books and love those books. Because I'm not like you, I'm not that interested in crime. Um, I, and I'm not interested in violence, really. But I'm interested <laughs> in, in, in broken people trying to scrape by <laughs> because I feel like that all the time because I feel like I'm barely hanging on a lot of the time. And so if I read about people that are going through hard times, it, it just makes me feel better. It's like you listen to a really heartbroken, sad ballad and it just, it, it's, it just gives me comfort, comfort. It's like, it's like a glass of tequila to me, you know? It's just, it just takes the pain away for a little bit. And so I've always been drawn to those books um, because of that, you know, and, and, and they're yeah. still my favorite. This book, the reason I edge this book in that world is because it's the change of, you know, of, of all these major cities in the West feels, feels so dramatic and desperate if you're not one of the ones making the change. Like if you're just noticing that the rundown house down the street is now uh, an $800,000 home that they, you know, they tore down the last one and they put up this really fancy one and, and and they're driving a fifty thousand dollar car, and you're like, well, how do they, how do they figure it out? Yeah, What's yeah. How can I figure this out? Because I, I'm not gonna make it. Um, so I wanted it to have that kind of desperate feel, and um, and and I hope I, I hope I gave it that. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I think you did. And, you know, I think to me, it's it, it, it's my favorite. Uh, you know, it's my favorite kind of noir novel in that way, and that it, you know, it it follows this character so intensely and like you said it's this broken desperate damaged character just making bad decisions and trying trying to do something to set things right for herself so I, I love it and you know this is kind of a similar question I guess but I, this this question might bomb um, because I haven't really thought it through at all but it was something that occurred to me today too um, you write about the west all your all your novels are about the west um, did you ever think of, or do you think of this book at all as kind of an urban Western in any way? I didn't, I didn't really think about it. You're right. I, I mean, I did, I always wanted to write a, a you know, a, a Portland book because Portland's been such a nice city to me. And I, I do think it's one of the America's great, great cities on so many different levels. And, and really no, no city can grow this fast and change this much and do it well. Um, so, so we'll just see, see how it pans out. Um, but, uh, I didn't think about it as a Western, but it is kind of, you know, I, I, I grew up, my uncle was obsessed with Westerns and yeah. one, of, one of my best childhood memories, probably my, one of my all time favorite memories was I'd wake up at, at my aunt and his house and we just spend all day watching Westerns. Like, and he never made you feel guilty. He just liked Westerns. And to this day, when I go to we just sit and watch westerns all day long. Yeah. And sometimes I didn't understand it, and and I and I have problems with westerns, you know, with the treatment of Native Americans. Um, but there was a uh, and and the beating up of horses back in the early ones. But you get to this sweet spot of westerns where 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 it's more about greed versus the the, the downtrodden, and they they don't deal with uh, 
beating up on Native American culture, uh, horses. They don't beat up on horses anymore. Um, and it's just about, uh, it's about good versus evil and rich versus poor. And then, and then I found a sweet spot with Westerns. So I do, I do love Westerns um, and they bring me comfort from when I was a kid, but I don't know if I thought of this one as a Western, but Jesus, <laughs> it, it, it seeped in there. You know what I've been thinking about since the last time we talked was the Dardan brothers. Uh, uh, I don't know if I'm saying that right. Uh, uh, but but the the, the movie um, two days in the night two yeah two days one night yeah yeah and how much I never thought of that uh, movie uh, when I was writing my book but it, they do feel similar um, I, I I think about that movie quite a bit you know and and I what I find so interesting about that movie is is it's so hard to stand up for yourself and fight for what's right for you and your family when you can barely get out of bed yeah. And, and, and I think I, I, I've personally struggled with that uh, most of my life where you're like, you can't think outside. You're just like, well, I just got to show up at the job I have and, and, and I, I can't think outside it. Like I, I had a cousin growing up and he worked construction and I worked in a warehouse and he worked construction for like three months. He's like, Jesus, man, I'm never doing that again. And he got out of it. He figured a way so he wouldn't have to do that kind of job where I was just like, I couldn't, I was, I didn't have the confidence or I didn't have it in me to think outside the box. I just was like, well, maybe my next boss, if I go to this other warehouse or this other trucking company, maybe my boss will be cooler or they'll pay me a little more. And I think Lynette has a lot of that in her. She's, she doesn't think outside what she knows and she just tries to grind it out the best she can. And I think her, her mom's that way too. And, and, and that's hard. It's a hard way to get by when, when, when everything around you is getting more expensive and, and really the city's not meant for people like you. Yeah. Yeah. That's all. And yeah, I, I, uh, I think it was after the first time I read it, I emailed you about that movie, um, two days, one night, uh, which I had just, you know, it came out a while ago, but I had only just seen it for the first time somehow, even though I really liked them. And yeah, so structurally, if anybody's not seen that movie two days, one night, structurally, it's fairly similar just in the compressed time period, um, that that movie takes place over two days, one night. The novel takes place over two days, two nights, uh, and you have a woman kind of on a mission. Beyond that, there's not really a, a lot that's that's very similar. But um, but you do have this. Both of them are driven by desperation, and they're both like highly the, these main characters: Lynette in The Night Always Comes, and Sandra in uh, or Sandra in Two Days, One Night. It's kind of you know just just deeply emotional, troubled, and, you know, t entirely sympathetic characters. Um, and, and so there's, there's a connection. There's definitely a connection there, I think, um, that, that's really interesting to look at. Yeah, it makes me feel good to think that it's connected because I, you know, it's like I really, I really identify, the, you know, I think my mother was a lot like that woman in that movie. Yeah. I, was, I was a lot like that. Uh, and so if, if it makes me feel really proud that my book could somehow feel like that movie a little bit um, because I, cause I liked it so much. And that, you know, I guess, I guess that's what I write about uh, generally is like, how do, how do you survive when you're, when you're, you know, when you're, when you're crippled yourself, like how yeah. do you for yourself when, and take care of yourself when you can barely stand up? Uh, I've always been interested in that. And I, I, you know, and again, that leads us back to noir, which is those, those, those black lizard books really do well, which is, you know, all those, most of those guys in those books are hanging by a thread. And then, yeah. then, and then, the, and then you throw in a bad situation, bad situation <laughs> find themselves in, and then it all goes south. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. So um, I don't know, I don't have a clock in front of me. How are we doing on time? Uh, let me see, I got one. Uh, I think it's 3.40 my time. So we've been doing, we've been rapping. For okay, so. I'll ask one more quick question and then we can open it up uh, for the q and if that's cool. Um, so one of the other things I, I think I first said to you was um, that the great Portland novel, you know, this this immediately to me kind of joined, joined the ranks of the great Portland novels. And not that I not that I know a ton of Portland novels, but I do know and love uh, Don Carpenter's Hard Rain Falling and and um, Kent Anderson's Night Dogs. Uh, do you have other, are there other Portland writers, Portland novels that you 
thought about or that you um, kind of just that served as an inspiration for what you were doing here and how you wrote about the place? Uh, you know, for, for this book, I wasn't really thinking. Uh, Heart Rate Fallen was an interesting book. That, yeah, that one, for sure. I think, uh, um, you know, the crazy thing is, is I was on tour in, and I think I was in England or Ireland or somewhere like that. And I stumbled into a bookstore and, and this guy and he go, we started talking. He asked where I was from. I said, Portland. He goes, well, man, you might, you must be a huge Don Carpenter fan. And I was like, well, I don't, I don't know, even know who that guy is. And, you know, I'm not the smartest guy in the world, but, but I do read a lot of books and I'm interested in books set in Portland. And, um, and it was because no one in Portland really knew him. And it was only in, in the UK that they republished him. And that book became kind of famous over there again. And it kind of swung back. And then, you know, a year later, a year and a half later, that book kind of hit again in Portland. And so it's really interesting that the books that, that are right, that are set often in, in your neck of the woods, don't even, you're not even aware of it. And it's a guy from a different country that, that, uh, yeah. that <laughs> onto it. but yeah. That's great. All right. Um, so, uh, sorry, I, I went went a little bit longer than we uh, than we went to. So, Caitlin, I'll turn it over to you for the yeah. Q and A. It was all really good stuff. Um, so, I would also just like to point out that like we have like a pretty international crowd. Um, got some guy walking watching from the six in the morning in Australia. <laughs> oh, thanks. <laughs> so we have a lot of questions. So uh, I'm just going to try and go and like order as, as received and maybe skip some stuff that you've already covered. But um, okay, so um, in order of they were received, uh, Josh would like to know, um, has John Prine had any influence uh, on your music and or writing? Did your paths ever cross? He's a huge fan, looked on your work. I mean, John Prine is, you know, I, 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 was, I was a house painter for like 10 years. And one of the guys I worked with, all he listened, he listened to two people. He had a, a lifelong crush on Nico Case and, um, and and he loved John Prine. And I didn't really know John Prine until I started painting with him. And so I listened to him and Nico Case probably every day for, for <laughs> on and off for years, really. Um, so... I wish I could say that I was influenced John Prime, but I'm not as witty or smart as him. And I don't, I'm, I'm too fucked up in the head, I think, to write like him, although I wish I could. Um, but I love him and I hope, I hope his writing come somehow seeps inside me and I start writing like him because uh, he's a genius. And no, man, I never, I ne the closest I ever got to him was hanging out with them with that dude that just listened to him and Nico Case all day. <laughs> um, okay, so kind of switching gears, this is a craft question. Uh, Rob, he's from Chicago. He loves the book, he just finished it this afternoon, uh, but could you talk a bit about how, when you were writing it, you chose to make the story unfold in such a compressed time frame? And um, he thinks it's kind of unusual for you, but... Um, yeah, it is. I've never done that before. I, I think it was just because um, when things are changing so fast and you feel like you're being left behind, you get desperate. And, and, and every time I've made really bad life decisions, it's when I'm desperate and you start thinking the life's passing you by. And so you have to do something dramatic to catch up. And, and so I needed the, I wanted the book to have that kind of feel where, where, um, where it all kind of culminates for her, the survival is buying this house. And when she feels like that's falling apart, she's, she's in free fall and she's kind of trying to, to salvage it the best she can. So I wanted it to have a desperate feel um, for that reason. And, and because everything around her is changing so fast, I think she's just scared. Um, all right, thank you. So next question comes from uh, Grant in Perth, Western Australia, 6.10 a.m. So crazy. Um, so he is a huge longtime fan of your music, but um, he finds that sometimes he notices characters from your books and he feels like he already knows them from your music. Um, is that intentional? And is he going to recognize anyone in this new book from your music? Uh, yeah, you know, I mix them a lot, you know, especially the early ones like Northline I wrote a bunch of songs about uh, the woman Allison Johnson I wrote a, 
you know, all my early books started as songs, so they always kind of mix. This one, not so much. This one was different. There wasn't a lot of songs in it. I wrote songs after I finished this. In the UK, we're putting out a, a version of the book that has a soundtrack to it. Um, but for this one, it didn't feel like songs really uh, until till I, till I took a breath afterwards. Um, but yeah, they all kind of live together, the stories and the songs. Well, that's such a treat for your readers and listeners. And I imagine maybe for you too, or do you ever want like a break from all these people in your head? Um, that's just a question for me. No, I mean, I like, uh, I've spent my whole life, it's a bad habit and I'm ashamed to admit it, but I spent my whole life just trying to disappear into, into different worlds. Uh, and, and so, and they, 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 as fucked up as they are, the stories, they bring me a lot of comfort and, uh, they, you know, it's kind of saved my ass in a way. Yeah. Um, okay, I'm going to skip around a little bit because I think this is a, a really a, a full question. Um, okay, so this is Gary. He's in uh, England, uh, so he hasn't yet read the book, but he wonders if you're aware of Jessica Bruder's Nomadland when writing it, as it seems to have a companion theme, even though it's nonfiction. And then in an interview that you gave for the um, Under a Western Sky, book you said that the free was the most difficult book that you'd written and so like compared to the free how hard or easy was this one this is a long question so let me know if you need a, a refresher it's a good question though Gary um and has the COVID lockdown helped or hindered your writing um you know I, I'm almost through with Nomadland right now and and I swear to god it fucking makes me break out in a cold sweat yeah. I, I was raised my mom was obsessed with living in her car she was so scared of it and there she never really was close to it or anything i mean she had the same job and we were really stable but i think because she didn't really have a big net underneath her and not a retirement plan um she was and she worked with a lot of homeless guys she was obsessed with the having that someday she was going to end up in her car and she always said you were only like two or three bad moves away from ending up like that so Nomadland is, I, I can't read very much of it a day because it, <laughs> it freaks me out too much. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's not an influence directly, but that those ideas have always, I've always struggled with that, those ideas and, the, and, and, and been scared of that. Um, the free was difficult because there was no romance in the place. Uh, like in Portland, like I got to drive around Portland for a couple of years in my mind and, and I get to go to all these places that I like to go and kind of think about Portland and, and, and I love Portland. So it was fun and the free, I, I intentionally just made it nameless towns. Um, and then the free, unlike Bill, I really struggle with uh, having multiple characters going at the same time, but with the free, I wanted that. So I, str I struggled with that. and. And none of the characters in the free are free. They're all kind of really shackled down. And that was difficult. There, was, there wasn't a lot of, you know, beer drinking and, and good times in the free. And so that, that was you know, uh, COVID. COVID's been great for me, actually, because I have a new dog and I've gotten to spend a whole year with my dog. I've gotten to see spring in Oregon in its entirety without traveling and fall in its entirety. And I got to write a novel, uh, a draft of a novel from the start to the finish when usually I just have to stop and start and stop and start and stop and start because I'm always traveling. But uh, I got a question for you, Bill. Can you talk a little bit about your new novel? Because I want to, because you haven't told me about it. Uh, man, no, nobody wants to hear about my new book. <laughs> we do. What, <laughs> um yeah i'll just i'll say just a quick quick thing about it so that the title is shoot the moonlight out which comes from a uh garland jeffries song um that i love and yeah it's it's uh it's set in the um well it starts in 1996 in southern brooklyn and then it winds up in 2001 um for the bulk of the book so it's kind of this the, the summer of 2001 and it's it's kind of what i've gotten comfortable doing in these last few books which is this big sprawling cast um i i think i think what you do is much harder um staying with one character i'm i'm always amazed that that 
you know, you, you make us care about uh, a character like Lynette in the way you do. I'm, I'm much more of a coward, I think, when it comes to writing like close to one character the whole time, because I feel like, you know, maybe it's the influence of like, you know, Robert Altman movies on me, but I like, I like the action of being able to move from person to person. So this is just another big sprawling um, cast and uh, just, you know, I don't know. I'm not going to ramble on too much about it. There's, there's some crime. There's some, there's some melodrama, you know, my usual, my usual stuff. I got one other question for you real quick, uh, which yeah. is did you ever write about Mississippi, uh, Oxford, or, or your, is your heart always in New York? Uh, I mean, I don't, I've written a couple of stories, but I don't think I'll, I, I don't know. I might, I've kind of, I've kind of messed with the idea of writing a novel. I don't, I would never write like a deep Mississippi novel. I might write a novel about some New Yorkers who wind up in Mississippi or something like that. But um, I don't know. I've lived here so long now that it, it's kind of getting to the point where I feel like it might, it might happen eventually, but I don't see it happening anytime soon. Cause I'm just kind of, digging back into the past every time I write a book now it's like I'm going back to the 90s or the 80s or, or um so yeah it's not it's nothing I've thought about I will say I looked at the I just looked at the chat quickly I took a break from the screen and looked at the chat on my phone and there are a bunch of good questions and some of them are questions that if we don't have time to get to I feel like Willie and I talked about in that print interview um which is on southwestreview.com yeah. Um, just about about greed and about um, there's a there's a I just noticed four or five questions I feel like are stuff we talked about and also your your original idea for the book uh, you talk about in that um, in that interview about how you you know, wanted this second part with a uh, that took place over a year um, so there's lots of good lots of good stuff in that in that interview if we don't get to them here um, in the chat. Yeah, and I, I just dropped the link to the Southwest Review interview again. Um, yeah, I, we're just totally spoiled. Everyone's asking so many good questions. But um, I think I like this one because y'all could both answer this. And I'd be kind of curious to see, to hear your answers. Um, so if you had a, your choice of actors to play Lynette and her mother, um, who, who would it be? And maybe also who would direct? I think these kind of cross genre or media medium. Man, I don't know. I really don't know. You know, I don't think about it that way. You know, I I really like the Florida project. Oh, I think that guy's name was Sean Baker. Sean Baker, I, yeah. I think that would be interesting. I like those like real tough, uh, like when they're working class stories, I like them when they're real down to the bone. Um, as far as actors, I just don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I, I, I always, I'll say this because I always think about it with Willie's books. I, and, I, and I think she was maybe attached to one of them at some point, but I always feel like Kelly Reichert would be the perfect director to, to do one of, one of your novels. Um, and and I, I thought that, I thought that when I read this the first time too, I thought, you know, it's kind of, you know, like, I mean, I'm thinking of, of movies like Wendy and Lucy and, um, and you know even even night moves to a certain extent uh but i think she'd be a great director for it i i don't know if i could think of lynette's i think when i read every once in a while i picture an actor um but i i can't say with any honesty that when i was reading this book i pictured uh an actress play you know in the part of lynette i think i just you don't get a description of her and i, I like that i like that you know you're just kind of with her close to her and yeah, you know, I think probably you'd need some kind of un unknown or first time actress like coming out of the gate or, you know, somebody people don't, you know, you can't have like Kristen Stewart or somebody doing this. Um, you need somebody that is not as familiar, I think. Um, I don't know. I think like in novels, the, the older I get, it seems, uh, or the more I do it, the less I describe people. And yeah. I think, I think, you know, in a way, it's because, you know, as a reader, I like, I always create my own versions of them anyway, no matter how they look. And so I, I don't like to be reminded that the guy has red hair or, or uh, that sort of stuff, because then it throws a, it throws a loop or, or a branch into a, um, what I think they should look like or, or what I've, for whatever reason, have come up with. 
So yeah, it's weird that like with Lynette, I never described her once, uh, you know, and, and, and the mom I only described, you know, one time, for, you know, and, and for two sentences really. So yeah, it's, yeah. It's, so it's shit. <laughs> All right, no, there's so many good, I'm gonna pick kind of like a softball one, um, again, because so much um, this conversation was so good, but um, you know, some heavy stuff. Um, so, oh shoot, I lost it. Okay, uh, so Hosho would like to know tequila. What's your favorite tequila? I'd like, you know, both of y'all can answer this one too. I mean, you know, I drink Centenario. I like it a lot. Um, uh, I just bought a, a really expensive one, uh, and I can't remember the name because I only drink. Basically, I just drink uh, Centenario. Um, I, I like it. It's my favorite. And I try to stay off the tequila. Tequila, uh, alcohol, and writing is known to be the death <laughs> of writers, and it is. Uh, you know, and as I get older, I can't can't take it like I used to uh but yeah Centenario and, and and a beer is pretty good there's there's some uh, there's some tequila in the novel it was Lynette's dad orders orders uh some tequila when he comes into the bar I think he orders Don Julio which is just shows what an asshole he is because he the second he has to pay he drinks Hornitos but when 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 his daughter has to pay for it um yeah the dad's all about like the working class guy. They, they, he's already been pushed out of his job. I mean, pushed out of his home um, for, from gentrification, but he's a, a painting contractor and he's making so much money. He, he's psyched because he's getting to buy a boat. And you're like, man, the whole world's going to be falling down on you. And you're just excited because your daughter, you get free drinks off your daughter. Uh, your wife gets free or your girlfriend gets free health care. You get free cable and, uh, you know, you're gonna buy a boat. Yeah. Oh man, um, Bill, are you a tequila guy? Oh man, no, I don't drink tequila. I just drink whiskey. Sorry, I, I don't. I'm not. Tequila's never been my, never been a good match with me. It's trouble. Uh, I don't. I can't do it. <laughs> um, that, uh, that Sam Shepard. You know, I'm a huge Sam Shepard fan, and he said there's a really cool. Uh, and I'm, I'm gonna screw up screw it up but it's it was him saying like you know about his dad he had a really hard time with his dad and throughout his all his books he writes about that but he said you know i changed my last name so he changed his last name he changed the way he walked he changed the way he talked he changed the way he dressed but then when he was in his 30s he met his dad's girlfriend tequila and realized him and his dad were the same guy and I thought, Jesus, that's heavy. That's so heavy so <laughs> on so many different levels. Uh, <laughs> that one always st stuck with me. Yeah, that's great. Well, we are about out of time. And I want to apologize to the um, folks who asked questions that we didn't get to. Um, it's not because they weren't good. They were all actually wonderful questions. Um, uh, but before we wrap up, I just want to remind everyone that uh, Square Books has got signed book plate editions of The Night Always Comes, their first printing, first editions, if um, that is important to you. Um, and I, I linked it a couple of times, but I just want to um, thank everybody for taking time out of their evening to gather together and talk about this wonderful, and like, I wanna call it timely, but it, it's not really, it's kind of always like that, um, but it seems kind of timely novel and um, actually kind of, this is such a wonderful comment. It's not actually a question, but I think it's um, really wonderful. And, and I, I agree with him. Josh says that um, I once heard you say in an interview years ago that you write for the working man or woman to escape and that you felt success if someone after a hard Monday, mundane day could get lost in your book and not just park it in front of the TV. And that thought really resonated with him. It resonates with me too. And he says, um, carry on, you are succeeding. That was a dream of mine. And that's a fucking, still a dream. I mean, it's so hard to get somebody to read a novel. And when I first started, it was, I was trying to get my buddies. My dream was to get my buddies who don't like books to, to read. And how could you get them to read after work? Uh, I don't know if I've ever accomplished that, but, but that was always the dream. You have, according to Josh, and you know I, I'm not a writer, but as the bookseller, that is um, 
kind of a similar goal. Anyone can love to read. They just haven't always found the right book. And I think that um, this is the right book for, for a lot of people. And um, I'm just so grateful to both of you for spending time with us and in our Square Books readers. Um, yeah, I'll let y'all say goodbye too. There's no like gentle way to do a call. Thanks, Caitlin. Yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you, Square Books. Thank you, Caitlin. Thanks to everybody who uh, came out for this or, or whatever you do um, when you do this. Um, and thanks so much to Willie. Um, you know, like I said, my favorite writer. Um, and I'm, I'm really honored I got to talk to you about this book. And thanks for taking the time, man. Oh, yeah, the coolest. I wish we were hanging out now. And, and hopefully the world's stopped falling apart and we'll get to hang out soon. And, and I hope talk, so. Get to talk weird books. The other thing to remember about Bill is he's got an encyclopedic memory of all things movies, records, and books. And he's just one of the smarter guys I'll ever hang out with. So. Uh, if you ever get a chance, no. listen to him and read him. And uh, if you see him in Oxford, get his top movie picks because they're always genius. <laughs> like Wanda, he turned me on to the movie Wanda. Uh, and that's one of the most beautiful, heartbreaking movies I've ever seen. Yeah, I love one. I'm, thank, thanks for saying that, man. I'm, I like a lot of stuff. I'm, I'm far from a genius, uh, but thank you for saying that. And yeah, Wanda's, Wanda, everybody should go watch Wanda if you haven't. It's one of my favorite, one of my favorite movies, Barbara Loden's Wanda, um, which actually I think, you know, I, I mean, I was trying to formulate a question. I know you wrote this book before you saw that movie, but I think there is, again, like this connection between the character of Wanda and the character of Lynette for sure and the same kind of broken broken person just floating floating through this yeah. disastrous situation kind of yeah, I think like Wanda's the kind of person that uh, that is given up of is young and given up yeah and it, yeah pretty because sometimes I think you feel like if you don't have much of a voice, then what's the point of even trying? Like, what's the point of trying to stand up if, if, if no one cares or you can barely do it anyway? And the answer is because you end up like Wanda. And that's yeah. the way, I mean, that's worse. So that's the hard thing about life is you always got to fight. Even if you don't have any fight in you and there, you don't see any hope to fight. Because if you don't, then you're left with, left with nothing and you're sitting at a bar with two guys you don't know and no one wants to or cares about what you say. And you're just buying your time like Wanda. Oh, that, that movie killed me. It still kills me. So thank you for turning me on to it. Oh, man, thank you for everything. Thanks for the books and the songs. It's great seeing you. Yeah, I hope, I hope we get to see each other in person. Definitely, man. OK, everybody, take care. Bye, thanks, Caitlin. See y'all next time. OK.